For 10 years now, I've been living comfortably, getting by, working as a male stripper. I know I'm talented and capable of more. However, I only do the bare minimum, which is all I need to pay my bills and get laid. I am burning inside to do more. My ideas are endless, but I always quit and revert back to this lifestyle every time I try something new and ambitious. Why am I so damn lazy? That's from Usman. Welcome to the show. Oh, hey, Usman. How you doing? Yeah. Hey, Steph, how you doing? Well, thanks. Um, I feel that this should be a webcam session. And of course, I every morning wake up and say, why don't I just make my living as a male stripper? I mean, women like famous guys and they like muffins, I should be said. So um, I uh, I understand that temptation if you're very, very your, deeply. I hope you're looking for your big break. I can help you out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, how did you get into the field? Um well, actually, that started, uh, I was in my early 20s, and uh, I, I actually grew up an obese kid. And so for me, getting healthy and getting fit was a big, big deal for me. And then I was in my early 20s, and uh, one of my first nightlife jobs was being a bouncer at a strip club where girls were dancing. So I was this you know, big guy, and uh, I was working with all these women, and I kind of got very comfortable with the nightlife. And uh, a friend of mine was a bartender or a waiter at a mail review. And at the time, I didn't really know anything about mail reviews. Uh, he kept asking me to come join, and I never joined him for the mail review. Uh, what me and him did go out for a wait. Part. Sorry, he wanted you to come and join him, looking at the male dancers. Well, he he was a waiter for that for the show. So he was a waiter, and there was male dancers, and for these male you know in these male reviews, it's it's an all woman audience. It's a bachelor party thing. So you're boy being being a waiter you know, being a waiter at a male strip joint must be like being the bassist in a hot band you know you you really are picking up the leftovers but all right keep going <laughs> hey I mean he was going he was coming home with good money and and I mean, it's 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 really you're a celebrity for those ninety minutes that show is happening I mean it's just the weirdest world that you enter it's a bizarre world so he's there he's 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 having a good time he's making money he keeps trying to convince me to do it. Uh, I don't want to do it. And then we go out one night and we go to a club in New York City where there's a, they have like an amateur striptease contest at a very big nightclub. Now I'm in my early 20s. I'm still a little bit of wallflower coming out of this whole uh, fat boy, you know, mentality. And uh, so he, he convinces me to do the contest and uh, I do it. And so men and women, they both get up on stage and they both strip and audience applause decides the winner. So me and a girl actually ended up tying, and I went home with uh, just under 500 bucks cash, and that wasn't the best part. The best part was as soon as I walked off the stage, all those women that I was afraid to kind of approach were all running up to me, asking for me for my phone number, trying to buy me drinks, and so I was like, this is pretty cool. I got right, because they, they got a real sense of your rippling virtues. <laughs> I got it. Exactly. Okay. This is, this is what right. New York women have to offer. Man meat 101. <laughs> They're like piranhas on a, on a wounded cow. Okay. It's, it's, so it. much, it's so much worse than most. I, I think uh, stepping into that world, you really realize how superficial it really is. I mean, yeah. women are really just as bad as men. They just hide it very well. So, you know, so, so that's, that's kind of where it opened me up to the whole thing. And I thought to myself, I can do this. And so I, uh, I joined the company that my friend was working for. Uh, this was probably around 2005. And uh, it was a very... Well, no, no, hang on, hang on. So for you, when you went up on stage, mm -hmm. I assume that, I mean, you're obviously a good looking and, and ripped guy. So when you went up on stage, was there an immediate positive reaction? Because you went from kind of shy to, you know, grinding it out, you know, like uh, Bridget Bardot riding a endangered snake. <laughs> and how did it feel for you that very first time that was there a high? Was there a rush? I mean, your sexual market value went through the roof. And certainly from an R selected standpoint, that's the biggest drug you can get. Is that what happened for you? That's probably exactly what happened for me. I, I, okay. uh, I, I, I've always been the kind of person to, I mean, I'm a, a talkative person. I'm a people person. I love being around people and I enjoy uh, being able to make other people happy and, 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 and being in their company. So you put me uh, you know, in front of an audience uh, for whatever it is. And at the time, I had no idea I wanted to be in front of an audience. So I'm, I'm there in that club and I do that and I relished in being in that spotlight. I enjoyed it very much. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, if, if you're in front of an audience uh, and you love being in front of an audience, let's say you do an hour speech a day, the, the problem is never the hour speech. It's the other 23 hours where you're not getting the audience contact high yeah. that is uh, troublesome and, and uh, difficult and feels kind of empty. Yeah, definitely. That, I, I can totally right. agree with that. Uh, eventually, it evolved into, and that's just the beginning part, but eventually it evolved into uh, becoming a master of ceremonies for the biggest show here in New York. 
uh, traveling, you know, going to different countries and different cities to perform. And so it all, it all kind of went all over the place, actually. So it, it went from that one little thing into a 10 year on and off career. Right. So you, you went to other countries, which is probably why people like Donald Trump are talking about bad trade deals in abs and burns of steel. You know, the abs and burns of steel trade deficiency that the U.S. has uh, is considerable. And you, my friend, are contributing to it. No, but, I, uh, I think I'm helping, actually. I, I think we're getting a lot more hot chicks coming into this country than anything else. I don't know right. if they had six Joe six pack. Actually, you know what? That's wrong. There's a lot of uh, foreign guys that show up for these shows and they don't speak any English, but they just point at their abs and women throw money and it's that simple. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so you basically quit whatever you were doing before and you went into this professionally, right? Right. I mean, now, it's not that easy in terms of, I mean, you really have to maintain, you know, obviously low body fat. I assume you're dehydrated from time to time, like I knew an underwear model once who was talking about how he couldn't drink water for two days before a shoot, uh, which was, uh, you know, made him so thirsty. He looked at water like a woman. And um, uh, so it's, you know, there, there's gym time. There's, I mean, there's not, it's not just the, the time doing the show, right? There's other stuff as well associated with it. Yeah, there's definite, there's a definite investment. I mean, uh, uh, you're, if you, most of the guys that I know, they go into the gym every single day. They're all on top of their diets. Um, it's, there's really no downtime. You kind of have to be like the genetically gifted to get away with a couple of workouts a week and still maintain your six pack abs and me coming from an obese childhood, I've got to work twice as hard to make sure I stay in shape. And, um, so what kind of, um, gym time are we talking about here? Uh, in the beginning for a lot of years, it was, uh, up to two to three hours a day. Yeah. Uh, right. And I mean, I, I love the gym in, in a lot of ways, but, but damn, it can get boring after a while. <laughs> Um, oh look! I'm still moving things. Oh, move, move some more metal in a dark place. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, it can get kind of dull. Uh, I mean, I used to I'd do a lot of uh, swimming when I was younger, and then eventually I just got tired of listening to nothing but gurgling and boredom, and I kind of had to stop. This is sort of when Walkmans came along, and you could do something more interesting. Because you know, if you're really working out, you can't really chat that much. Although I did have a gym buddy once, and my favorite thing to do was to make him burst out of laughter while he was bench pressing more than he could handle, uh, which was, uh, you know, not always fun, that's but a, fun. That's a, um, that's a dick move. <laughs> that is a dick move. That is a dick move. And uh, I only did it when he was using machines, never when he could injure himself. Ah, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a bit of a dick move. I mean, it's not as bad as tickling him with a boa uh, on the inner thigh, but you know, it was close. No, that's approved. That That's common. <laughs> <laughs> right. So... Do, is it is it straight guys that you're working with? I assume that there's some gay guys working in there as well. The majority are, I want to say, uh, virtually everybody says that they're straight. Uh, that, but then at the same time, you're going to have a handful of guys that do the gay scene as well. And the gay scene pays a lot more, uh, way, way more. I mean, you, a guy can make easily over a grand to $2,000 a night working in a gay club. And uh, a male review is a 90-minute show. And if you're a killer, you might make like 500 bucks. So, I mean, right. the 90, not $500 in 90 minutes is great, uh, but I mean, that, and th that's not a bad deal, I would say, by any stretch. You could show up for one show a week, and uh, you're good for the rest of the week, provided you're not trying to be a millionaire. And then, then there's private parties that you can do, and for every private party you get booked for, it's uh, $100 just for the booking, and that's not including tips. So you can easily walk out of there with two, 300 bucks if you wanted, you know, if, if the girls were tipping well, and they usually do. So it's, it's not a bad deal. A couple of parties a week, maybe one or two shows, and you know, it's all you need. So, Usman, tell me a little bit. I mean, I, I got to imagine that, I mean, obviously, I don't think gay to straight is a choice. But if it were, I would imagine even if you started out straight, looking at these grabby, dimly lit, hysterical, screaming Beatles mad women uh, with their mouths all wide, just waiting for some abbed guy to drop a bishop down their throat. Does that give you an odd view of female sexuality after a while? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I, tell, tell me about that. They were on such a pedestal before I started this. They were really, I, I was uh, I was your perfect man, giant, a white knight type of guy. I, I really worshipped them. Uh, and not, not, not to the extreme sense, but I really thought highly of them. I thought that there were these precious flowers, these nice girls that really needed to be treated well, and they didn't appreciate vulgarity or aggression or any of this stuff. And I learned very quickly that uh, you know, they, they respect the man that pretty much takes control and uh you know they they also respect the physical dominance i mean it, it, just having muscles makes such a such a big difference and i never realized that when i was before from before working out until after it's just 
is really something as simple as I mean, if you, you approach a girl and, and you're fit, and especially in that, in, in that context, like I said, it's, a completely, it's completely the other way around. Now, you go to a nightclub, you go to a bar, you go anywhere in the world, and you're either buying the girl drinks, trying to sweet talk her, and, and, and basically paying her for her time. In that place, it's the complete opposite. I mean, if a girl's not going to you know, show me a $20 bill within the first 10 seconds I talk to her, I'm moving on. I don't have the time. Yeah, I mean, certainly, if if you're there in a supplicating position, then you are uh, indicating that you have lower sexual market value than the woman, and women in general do not respond to men who have lower sexual market value than they do because of hypergamy and the desire to trade up. Yeah, definitely. And 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 what's also so crazy about being in that uh in that work environment is you'll find women that's Saturday night and women's some you know some chicks getting married Sunday. And it's Saturday night. She's getting married Sunday. She's asking you if you can go to her hotel room. You have women I'm sorry. Say, say that again? She wants basically to bang her the Saturday night before her wedding. Like it's, She it's, wants to have sex with the stripper yep. the night before her wedding? Yep. Boy, happens. boy, talk about the alpha fucks and beta bucks, right? I mean, because genetically, historically, prior to birth control, that impulse would have meant that she would have had sex with an alpha uh, the night before she gets married. Then she would have her honeymoon. Uh, but of course, if the sperm from the alpha was already uh, heading its way eggward, then the uh, the beta or the marriage partner would end up raising the alpha's kid and thinking it was his own, right? Yeah, pretty much. That's uh, and uh, it's just insane. Like uh, you, uh, that, that, and that's perfectly true. But the thing is, it's just married women, women that are in relationships. They completely during the show they have no boyfriend. We we we. This is a funny thing. So let's say you go to a group of girls, and you're partying with them, you're drinking with them, you're dancing for them, you're making money off of them, and they're exchanging, they're giving you their phone numbers and they want to see you and all this other stuff happens, maybe the party moves on to an after party. Now you leave the strip show and now you're at another nightclub and you're at this after party. Then, you know, you'll find out that so-and-so girl's married, the other girl's got a boyfriend, the other girl's got a fiance, this one lives with her boyfriend. You learn that all these women are pretty much spoken for, but they're all just jumping all over your shit during the show and wanting to party with you afterward and giving you their phone numbers and it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of madness. I, I think this... I don't, I'm not going to say this is uh, going to be the case. At least this is me, be, maybe me being a, an optimist. I don't think this is the case for all women across the board. I no, think, listen. I mean, it's a self-selecting group of women who are at a strip show. Well, no, no, no. Here's the thing. They're at a strip show for the most part because it's a bachelor party or a birthday party. So you're, you're not getting like, you know, chicks that are just horny on a Friday afternoon saying, oh, I'm going to go see some, 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 strip, some strippers tonight. The, the girls that you're getting are just generally dragged into a bachelorette party. You've got 15 girls. There's one special lady in the group. And all 15 of them end up buying tickets to a show because they have to go, right? It's, it's just a thing that these girls are going to do. And so you're getting some normal women there. You're not getting like just these, you know, cock thirsty sluts. You're just, you know, you're not, you're not getting them. They, they turn into that. But I think it's the environment that turns them into that. I think it's a New York City function. I think it's a big city function. So in other words, you have this big city where I feel like women outnumber men. And uh, at least quality men are, are, no, are, are really not anywhere to be found. I mean, they're making a lot of money. The guys that are quality men... They have their pick of the litter. I, I think over time what ended up happening was the longer that I was in this business and the more I look around, the more I realize that being an alpha, if you were getting, let's say, I don't know, spitball numbers, if you were banging, let's say, you know, 20 chicks a year, you're, you're banging double now. And it, I think if you're a beta, if you were banging 20 chicks a year, you know, 10 years ago, you're probably banging five now. I think women are just flooding to the alphas and completely disregarding the betas altogether. Well, I, there's certainly truth in that, right? I mean, there's the 80-20 rule that 20% of the guys get 80% of the women. And in studies where men have been asked to rate women's looks, they're about fair. They rate about half the women above average and about half the women below average. But uh, women, when they rate men's looks, they rate 80% of the men as below average. Uh, and that's, of course, because women are hypogamous. They want the most attractive or the highest status male. And certainly as the guy up there, you know, drenched in oil and, and uh, gyrating uh, and all of that, you'd be the highest status male around in that particular environment. And um, so, yeah, no, and this is why marriage has collapsed for the lower and middle classes uh, in America, and marriage is remaining relatively stable for the upper classes. Uh, women uh, all want to get higher status men. And of course, now that women are getting more educated and the majority of students in school are women and so on, and women with college degrees almost never want to date a guy without a college degree, uh, certainly not settle down. So, oh, no question that the alphas are cornering 
uh, the market at the moment. And this is another reason why it's tough to change society is the alphas have all the power and the alphas are getting all the women. So why would they want to change anything? Exactly. Uh, of course, the betas are getting shut out and that requ that ends up with a catastrophic demographic winter with no reproduction and all that. But uh, yeah, it's brutal for the betas these days. And, and you just said it, right? Why would the alphas want to change anything? And there we are with my with my problem here. I have no real incentive to change anything. All right, because, sorry. Yeah. I, I want to get to that in a second. Yeah. I, just, I just want to pause for a second on, on something that, that sure. you said. Sure. Uh, but let me ask you a little bit earlier. Um, you were talking about you know the, the difficulties of working out and so on. Mm. Do you know if a lot of strippers are using um, you know human growth hormone or steroids? I mean, are, are yeah. they using something that's, things to help out? That's common. That's common. I mean, yeah. I, I, I've prided myself on being a lifetime natural, which makes it ten times harder. And um, that's I, I I cycle my my dancing seasons on and off because. I can't be this ripped guy all year round. So I'll, you know, following Thanksgiving up until about, I want to say springtime, I just won't dance at all. And I'll focus a little bit more on other, this is when I get my creative burst, right? When I want to do other things. Uh, it, this, the season dies down as well. It's not as busy. You're not getting as many parties. The shows don't attract as many women. And, uh, you know, that's when I'll let my body fat percentage come higher, focus a little bit more on strength and power, and then shred down for the summer and try to hold on to that low body fat percentage as long as I can during the summer months, maybe into the fall, and let my body relax again. Because your body can take a beating of uh, being that lean very long. It, you have to be genetically gifted again to be able to maintain low body fat percentage uh, and still have high testosterone levels and lower uh, cortisol levels. Yeah, and it's tough on the joints uh, and, and the tendons and all that. It's not just muscles. Well, that's, it. that's if you're going to be dehydrated. So if you're going to maintain a lower body fat percentage and uh, you're not dehydrated, uh, you're, you're taking in the right amount of minerals and everything else like that, and you're also drinking enough water, you're not, you know, because you, the thing is this, subcutaneous water retention depends on how much sodium you're taking in and how much carbohydrate you have. So if you're going to reduce carbohydrates and you're going to reduce sodium, let's say pre-show, you'll drop like five pounds of water weight before show. And then you could even have maybe a little bit of carbohydrate to fill your muscles up a little bit extra before the show begins. So there, there are tricks that you can play to look leaner and tighter than usual, but for the most part, most guys don't really get into that kind of detail. Uh, I dabbled in a little bit of natural bodybuilding and I'm a fitness trainer as well. So I, I, I can get into this kind of thing, but I mean, for, for most guys, uh, you know, they're either genetically gifted or they're just doing the basics in the gym or they're just taking gear. And a lot of it's, it's very common because it's a good investment. I mean, just spending 500 bucks a month on your steroid cycle, you're, you're like this giant, you know, buffed up alpha God at the show and no one, no one can compare to you. Right, right. Now, um, I just want to read something very briefly because you, you pointed out something that, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'll put forward the radical thesis that if men listen to what women say they want, both men and women end up less happy. <laughs> this is this is very, very important. Hello, Europe migrant crisis. I'm still talking to you. Uh, when men listen to what women say they want, both men and women end up less happy. So you know, we'll put a link to this below. A study called Egalitarianism, Housework, and Sexual Frequency in Marriage appeared in the American Sociological Review last year. And um, the assumption that people have is that when marriages become more equal, the sex in those marriages will improve, right? Because, you know, women say, well, I just want you to do the dishes and I want you to do the laundry and I want you to do all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, then if men listen... Uh, you would assume that women would be happier and, and the marriage life would improve and the sex life would improve, but um, it's not true. When men do certain kinds of chores around the house, couples had less sex. If men did all of what the researchers characterized as feminine chores, like folding laundry, cooking, or vacuuming, the kinds of things many women say they want their husbands to do, then the couples had sex 1.5 fewer times per month than those with husbands who did what were considered masculine chores, like taking out the trash or fixing the car. And it wasn't just the frequency of sex that went down when marriages became more, quote, equal. It was the quality of sex for the wives. Hmm. So the more traditionally husbands and wives divided chores, in other words, the more that men did manly things and women did feminine things, the greater the wife's reported sexual satisfaction. Right, right. Now, that's something you can sort of sit for an entire afternoon and ponder because it has such sort of deep ramifications well, I could boil on, that. on so many different things. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I could boil that down into a sentence. I, I tell young guys uh, that in, in, in basically one or two sentences. It's uh, a woman will not respect or fuck her bitch. If you're going to be her bitch, she will not fuck you. I'm sure that that was the original title on that, this New York Times article. They may have uh, 
they may have decided yeah, not to, to go to, with I, it at the end. I don't, I don't but the other thing too, right? So what's called sexual dimorphism, which is the behavior that animals have that is distinct mm-hmm. between the genders, more than just the fact that, you know, men have penises and women have vaginas. And so sex is about masculinity and femininity. I'm talking about sort of traditional heterosexual sex. And so the more the man acts like a woman, the less the woman's going to be turned on. I mean, that's an, unless she's a lesbian, <laughs> then, uh, but then of course, if you have two lesbians together, you get the phenomenon known as lesbian bed death, which is that lesbians have sex, uh, you know, once or twice a month. Mm. Uh, gay guys, I think that's every day. <laughs> to married heterosexual <laughs> yeah, a couple of times a week. Like, kind of uh, much, much higher rates of domestic violence as well, like lesbian couples. I think they're the highest of all, of all the pairings. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, very significant domestic violence. Um, but yeah, this is, this is sort of important that women will say that they want men to be like women. Mm-hmm. And then they are unhappy when men are like women. Like there's, there's two facts that are kind of going on. Depends on what kind of women you're talking about. It really depends on what yeah. kind of women you're talking about. But it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's just a, well, do you want to be a woman? Uh, I want you to be a woman. And if the man says no, then she'll sleep with him. And if he says yes, then she'll um, use him to borrow money exactly. so that she can go to a strip club and sleep with you. She immediately but, friend zone. Um, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, friend zone. So um, d- two things are happening to, to particularly white Western women. Number one is that they're miserable miserable, miserable, miserable people. Now, feminism was supposed to bring equality, which was supposed to bring satisfaction and happiness. Number one, they're miserable. Number two, shockingly, the life expectancy for white Western women is declining at the moment. It's declining at the moment. So not only are they miserable, but they're stressed and sick and dying. Uh, so of course, all we have to do is wait for women to admit that they were promptly wrong about certain aspects of feminism and uh, agree to change. That will never happen. That will never happen. <laughs> I was That's waiting. So I was, was going to say, "No way, you really believe that?" <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. Not going to happen. Uh, men are just going to need to accept the facts and be men again. So I don't know. It's tough. You've been raised by a single mom. What does it mean to be a man? Well. Um, that's a challenge. But anyway, I want to get back to your, I just sort of wanted to point that stuff out, but I do want to get back to your, no, no, that's, your that's, that's, that's more than fair. But I mean, just, just to add to that uh, very quickly, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing now, this whole, uh, I don't know if you know about the, the MGTOW phenomenon, that's kind of like a response to feminism. Uh, yeah. this is the men going the wrong way kind of thing. I just, all of a sudden I feel like women wanted to be, uh, and I, I don't, I don't want to use the word selfish, but I feel like it just, just being like, they wanted to be able to do everything on their, on their own. And, uh, to, to to divide themselves away from men, to almost be a, almost say to themselves, we don't want men involved in our business and doing it completely on their own. While men always, I think, thought of doing things on their own, but partnering up with women. And now men are pretty much with this MGTOW thing, saying, well, we not only don't want to be involved with women, we don't want to be involved with society on the whole and government and whatever and you name it. And, and they're just completely isolated uh, in this in this bubble of, uh, of of I feel like selfishness. And I remember hearing. Um, a video you did not too long ago where you talked about, I think it was atheism and uh, how you were disappointed in that there's no real investment into the future and there's a lot of selfishness with atheism and they're try- and being an atheist, you're going to try to you know, impose your atheist religion upon others through, through the state of, 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 of whatever, of whatever kind of redistribution you know, uh, rules you want to make up with your atheist faith. So, so the thing is, there's no, st- there's no skin in the game because there's no kids, you're not really investing uh, you, you're not thinking about family, and I think with MGTOW and with feminism, you're just taking a dump all over family with both of those. Uh, so it's just, it's just, I don't know what direction we're going to go, but if, I, I think Japan is, a, is, is an example of what can happen when men pretty much give up and become obsessed with their appearance and with, uh, you know, kind of uh, just being in this bubble where they're satisfying all their urges and needs with either paying women for their services or just going to electronics and machinery. I think Japan is leading the world. Yeah, I mean, that, that there was always this science fiction story that the robots that human beings create to do their work for them, the utility robots, they somehow rebel. But here you have the robots just going inert, right? The utility robots, which is the men in mm-hmm. society, yeah, just just tired of being uh, lassoed by family courts and used to serve women. And, you know, the, the I, I don't know. The MGTOW guys, to me, don't fall into the same category as the leftists. If you're a leftist and you don't have kids, then you are preying upon the young because you're relying on other people to absorb the cost of creating the taxpayers that you need to feed on in your old age. But the MGTOW guys, they're not consuming usually a lot of taxes. Some of them go ghost or whatever and, and off the grid. The MGTOW guy is not consuming a lot of taxes. Uh, and uh, I don't view that in the same way. Uh, they're just basically saying uh, it is. I can I can do a a calculation of risk and reward when it comes to involvement 
with uh, females and you know this hysteria and all these false rape rape allegations you know they fall like a javelin deep into the heart of masculinity uh, and you know we could spend 20 minutes just listing off all of the rape accusations recently that have destroyed men's lives that have been proven to be utterly false and for whom the women have not been sanctioned or punished at all. Yep. Uh, and there's no feminists usually crying out for the punishment of women for false rape accusations. Whereas, of course, if women cared about rape, really cared about rape, they'd be the first to line up to um, call for the punishment of women who falsely accuse men of rape because that means that it becomes tougher to uh, convict uh, the next time and so on. Yep, you're 100%. So I, um, uh, I would just say that I, I don't view the, the MGTOW phenomenon as particularly... Um, selfish. Uh, it is a rational response in some ways to the risks um, of, uh, and, and I, you know, if I hadn't met my wife, I would, I would definitely be along those lines. Well, I, mean, I, mean, without I, a doubt. I dabbled with the idea of MGTOW. I personally know MGTOWs and uh, I, I agree with you. They're not, they're not leftists at all. I, I, a lot of MGTOWs are actually very libertarian, conservative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're going, they're going galt, right? They're, they're doing a, exactly. they're, they're taking their sperm and, and staying home. And uh, that's a completely understandable from a certain perspective of risk and reward. And if you don't meet a great women, and I've listened to some of the MGTOW channels, and the MGTOW channels that I've listened to, the men have had disastrous experiences with women, dangerous experiences with women, and they know a lot of guys who have smoking craters where their testicles used to be because the wrong woman dragged them through, uh, you know, the usual and status nightmare of family court and, and divorce and alimony and child support and God knows what, and their lives are destroyed. So, it's not, you know, from if the woman has nothing to offer except sex, and that sex is like uh, Russian roulette uh, every time you have it, uh, and, and given the prevalence of uh, pornography and so on, uh, you know, the man can uh, spend a few minutes rubbing one out, or he can go into the truly dangerous, leg-exploding landmine of modern female male sexual relationships. So from a cost-benefit standpoint, it makes total sense. And of course, people do go on strike when they are in unprofitable situations. That's why nothing ever got done in Soviet factories. Because, you know, as the old joke used to say, uh, you know, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. It all just becomes uh, nobody does anything in the absence of positive incentives. That's why one of the reasons why socialism and communism don't work. And so um, given that um, sexuality has been socialized by the state and the consequences of sexuality have been socialized by the state. Basically, male-female relationships are just another Soviet factory and uh, men are just uh, going through the motions or, you know, if you don't have su suffer any sanctions for not showing up to a bullshit job, why would you bother? You're right. All right. So, um, let's get on to what you want to do. Now, I won't ask in particular what you want to do because that I don't think is... Uh, is is the key. The question is, why are you so lazy? Yeah. That's what your question is. What's your time frame? When do you think you will be unable to continue in this job? <laughs> I know guys in their 40s that are still doing this. So I've got at least 10 years if I wanted to keep going in this direction. So I've got time. Uh, uh, but the thing is... And can, can you yeah. save enough to, to retire after that? Um, not by being a dancer. No, you have to get involved on the back end. If you're, if you're going to get in the business, um, of <laughs> sorry, you might, you might want to explain to my listeners <laughs> yeah. what getting involved in the back end okay. means. The back end of the business, the company, come on, Steph. <laughs> I, what I mean is like running the actual shows, uh, selling the tickets, promoting the shows, uh, booking the parties. That's the back end. The, the front end would be obviously the, the, you know, being the actual entertainer performer that's being booked for the show. So if, the business side, yeah, exactly. right? Rather than the product, you you're involved in the the business side. Exactly. You sell, okay. you know, you sell tickets. You're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. You don't sell tickets. You're making a couple grand a month. Now, do you have interest in the business side of stripping? I I have. I've actually uh, partnered up with the owner of uh, the largest company in New York back in. Actually, the largest company in New York was not the largest company back in 2008. And uh, I partnered up at, in 2008. They lost their partner. So there were two companies working together. They, the, the main company lost its partner, and I became like the main master of ceremonies and performer for the show all throughout 2008. Uh, by the end of 2008, I uh, partnered up with the owner of that company and started a new show in Atlantic City. And I ran that show all throughout Atlantic, Atlantic City um, all throughout uh, 2009, and I had intentions to go to Boston and open up a second venue. So, I mean, I, I, I come from this sort of like, wanting to be independent, having kind of an entrepreneurial spirit kind of thing. And, uh, you know, me and the owner had a falling out. He was trying to screw me on some some money issues. And so I just said, you know what, if we're going to do this now, 
I don't want to be 10 cities deep and you, you're, you're trying to screw me over on money. So let's, let's, let's walk. So I walked away from them. And uh, ever since then, I've been kind of bouncing around just performing for shows and kind of, uh, you know, one idea will hit me and I'll like, let me, let me try this and I'll try it for a little while. And I guess once the rubber meets the road, I get kind of turned off and I just go back to, back to the performing business. I, I usually bounce around. For the most part, it's going to be in the dancing business. I never really wanted to invest too much time in the personal training or the fitness business. But, uh, you know, that, that's another thing that I'm very good at. And it, it pays the bills when, the, when I'm not dancing. So Now, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's um, a bit of a one-way street in so far as it's a little hard, if I understand this right, it's a little hard to think about sort of getting – mainstream suit and tie accounting type work to some degree of course your past is going to be very visible and available to everyone is there sort of a concern for you that if you move out of I mean I'm going to call you the sex trade because you're not obviously a sex worker but if you move out of this sort of titillation or stripping business that your past might sort of clang along behind you and interfere with opportunities outside this field no, I actually, uh, for two reasons. One, uh, a mirror view, uh, I, I know there's a stigma there, but I think with, uh, with the Magic Mike movie coming out and, you know, just the, now that there's a little bit more light on what that kind of, kind of work actually is, I'm not sure if that same stigma is there anymore. So uh, I think it's kind of one of those things where you can kind of laugh it off. Like, huh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's one thing I think um, female dancers are usually damaged. Male dancers are just, you know, guys trying to take advantage of an opportunity. I, I, don't, I don't think male dancers are for the most part. I mean, some of the most normal, down-to-earth professional guys uh, you'll ever meet. You'll, you, you, I mean, not, not in, in the sense that you'll ever meet them, but if you were to go to the show and talk to these guys, uh, you've got artists, you've got musicians. Um, I've, I've got a younger brother who, uh, you know, he, he dabbled in uh, actually uh, overseeing the operations of the show, and uh, he talked about it on an interview for medical school and got in. And that was one of the key points that they appreciated. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it, it, you, you don't know if it'll hurt you or not, but I mean, I'm not worried about that. The other point that I want to make is I don't like working for people long term. So I don't care about – I'm not the kind of guy that regrets what I've ever done. Uh, so if I were to talk to somebody or try to apply for a job or try to work in a place where they were to hold uh, that against me, regardless of all the other positives that I can bring to the table, I'd rather not work there. Right. Right. I mean, Sylvester Stallone, uh, Cameron Diaz, um, a bunch of Matt LeBlanc and, you know, the guy from uh, Friends. There were, you know, a whole bunch of people who got started in Channing Tatum, well, Bruce Willis, all these. Yeah. David Duchovny, believe it or not. I mean, I know he seems to be a bit of a sex addict uh, as a whole, but um, the there are of a lot of actors, of course, who started out. I mean, even Schwarzenegger uh, started out doing some uh, well, I guess some titillating <laughs> ancillation stuff. Even Helen Mirren, who is like one of the queens of British acting, uh, started out doing some pretty salacious uh, stuff. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think that it's a um, – as far as I understand it, there's a lady named Sasha Gray. But anyway, <laughs> even Jackie Chan did some, some stuff if, that was pretty, if, uh, pretty if, raunchy. If I'm being ostracized for it, I'll just use a lefty, uh, you know, what, what, what narrative and just say I'm being, you know – Slut shamed. There you go. And I'll just do one. Hell, for Marilyn Monroe, of course, started off uh, doing topless shots and uh, uh, ended up, uh, what, dying on her own vomit or something. But anyway, so, yeah, and, and I think that there is a perception, you know, rightly or wrongly, there is a perception that if you are a, a female stripper, then you're damaged goods. But if you're a male stripper, you're a good time party guy who made some cool decisions and, and had a lot of fun, right? Pretty much. Right. Right. Okay. So... The question then is, first of all, help me understand, I mean, you, you work out hard mm -hmm. to, to keep your physique, mm -hmm. but what is it that you say is lazy about yourself? I, I don't think working out is the hard part. The thing is, once you find something that you like to do and you're good at, you're going to do it, and, and even if you weren't being paid to do it, you'd still do it. So, you know, I'll find the time, I'll always find the time to go to the gym. I, I'd rather not sleep and, and, and be able to find that hour or two I mean, I'm, I'm much smarter and better with my time now. I can go into the gym in not one hour, and I can do the same thing that I used to do back in three hours. But I had to put in those many, many hours of investment years before to learn to become efficient to the point where I can just go in and out and do what I do now. But, well, plus, um, plus it's, uh, it's something that because you've achieved a certain level of fitness, maintenance is a lot easier than getting there, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. 
like maintaining uh, a weight loss, like I lost like 30 pounds a couple of years ago, maintaining that is pretty easy. Losing it wasn't necessarily <laughs> particularly easy, but I'm one of the two or three percent of people who loses weight and actually keeps it off. Yeah. But um, so, so okay, so what is it that your day, g give me a sort of typical weekday when you when you have a show. What's your schedule? When you up, uh, what do you do and, and what's your day like? Right, so right now I'm not doing any shows at the moment, but uh, I, left, I left my company back in November. So I'll give you the schedule up until last November and uh, then when I started my own brand of women's entertainment, actually, it's a totally different schedule for that. So back, back when I was doing the shows with, with, a, with a major company here in New York, uh, honestly, um, from, I want to say, Sunday through Thursday, well, Sunday through Wednesday, you've got nothing to do. You're free. You wake up in the morning, you go to the gym, you, you hang out with your friends. Okay, well, hang on. Yeah. Just be more specific, if you don't mind. What time are you getting up typically okay. on a weekday? I mean, you, you work late, right? Yeah, so. yeah. So, so, so for me, honestly, uh, it would be anywhere between... Uh, if I'm if I'm feeling energetic and I've got things to do, uh, and God knows what that even means, things to do, but I, I'll get out of bed anywhere between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Um, right. Sometimes we'll sleep until like noon, but I, I generally don't like being in bed longer than noon. If I'm in bed longer than noon, that probably means I went to bed six in the morning and I was drunk. So yeah, and I mean it's it's kind of tough to get your day, day get your day going when you're kind of rolling down the hill of the afternoon, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, I mean the thing is the day's so long because I mean you're 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 up at noon, but you're not going to go go to bed until three four in the morning anyway. So you still have the same number of hours. It's just the the time frame is different. That's all. So right. So um, so for instance, if Mike wanted to be a stripper, he's already on the schedule. Okay, that's I was important. waiting for the crack about my schedule. Yeah, I was right. just you know <laughs> just waiting for. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much the only thing that he, <laughs> that's, and he's ready to roll. It's a smooth transition yeah. for Mike. <laughs> uh, it's just envy for me because uh, I'm a parent. Um, oh. Okay, so um, and that would be the so sort of what? Okay, so what? Let's say you get up at eight or ten, mm -hmm. uh, and let's say you have a show. I, when, when do you have to show up for show okay. prep? So usually it's uh, six p.m. You get, you get to get to the show by uh, six p.m. There's uh, check-ins and like check-in fees and everything else like that. You got to pay to work because uh, you can make good money for there. I mean, all dancers pay uh, the club money before they work. So uh, and you uh, you make your money off tips, is that right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the thing is, if you're if so you have a negative minimum wage. Okay. <laughs> got it. Well, if you're if you're booked to perform, you're already getting paid in advance. The minimum booking call, uh, the minimum the minimum booking is going to be a ten minute performance on stage for a uh, hundred bucks, and then whatever you make on the floor is yours. Whatever you make on stage in tips is yours. So that, that's pretty much the way it goes. So you just got to be prepared for a 10-minute performance. And if you're good at what you do, it's pretty easy. It's not that extreme either because, I mean, most of these guys strip down to boxer briefs. It's, it's like you, you're, you're dressed the same as you would be dressed on the beach. So it's really not this banana hammock, G-string kind of like madness that was there back in the 90s, you know. They, they can't <laughs> tell you whether you're Jewish or not just by having a glance. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure what Jewish guys are packing or not, but I'm not, I don't know why you would know that. <laughs> oh, I'm just a circumcision joke. All ah, right. Okay. So, um, okay. So you show, but what do you do sort of in, in 10 o'clock till, till 6 PM? It, it's, it's open day. I mean, you're just, you kind of just slowly move along. You, you have your breakfast, uh, you know, you could, you know, maybe watch a couple of YouTube videos. You hit the gym, meet up with some of your friends. You get another meal in, you go home, you take a shower, make sure you're shaved, groomed, all that good stuff. Get dressed, drive down into the city, and there you go. You're, you're, you're. Are you pretty much like napalm manscaping down there? I mean, I assume that people don't want to see a whole lot of uh, Studley von Freebush action in their faces. No, right? I mean, the, it's just you get used to the standard. Standard is basically uh, you're, you're, you're generally always going to be tan. You're generally going to always be lean. You're almost always, always uh, shaven, top to bottom. Uh, you're full, full body. Uh, it, the grooming is such a pain in the ass. It's it, it but, <laughs> literally right. It, well, no, I don't go there, but, but I, I guess it depends on what kind of scene you're working. Maybe maybe you're gonna have to, but uh, it's 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 definitely yeah, it's definitely not fun. But I mean, it, it, it depends on how hairy you are. I, I know guys that are doing it every week, and I know guys that do it every month or every three months. It depends on how quickly your body hair grows back. But that's something you got to be aware of. Obviously, you don't want to show up with a hairy chest and. Right. And how many shows a week do you do when you're in season? When we're in season, uh, four shows a week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and some Saturdays are doubles. So we get two shows on Saturdays. And this is in New York. I know in uh, Vegas, right. Chippendales does. Oof, man. I think I've got a couple of friends that work down there in Vegas. And I think, from what I remember, I think they have two shows on Friday, two shows on Saturday, one on Sunday, and I think one every other day during the week except maybe Monday. So well, you can't do two shows on Sunday. We got to get to church, right? So <laughs> the best place to go after church, right? 
<laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So when it comes to feeling lazy, is it, did you feel that you sort of days are a semi distracted blur of nothing achieving much because you're kind of waiting for the night and then you sort of happens again? Is that yeah. how it's happening for you? That's, that's kind of a good way to put it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Do you think that you'll be, I mean, cause you know, performing is, is, is energy. Uh-huh. It it takes energy. Like for me, if I've got a great show, this is, you know, obviously it's a conversation, but it's a little bit of a performance as well. Huh. But, you know, at the end of the show, I mean, you know, it takes a while to sort of come down and be able to get to, to sleep. So getting ready for the energy necessary for a performance and then coming down off there, because a lot of energy in the crowd. Definitely. Right. There's a, a lot of energy that comes out of the crowd, particularly if it's sexual energy, that is very heady. I you know, obviously, right? It's part of an, a, um, it's like an addiction to, to, to go and get that high as well as the money, of course. So, so getting ready for a show is not inconsequential. It's not just like, well, I've got a day and then I, it's just for 10 minutes, you know, it's like, no, it's a lot more than that, uh, for, in terms of getting ready. And, and, um, of course it, you want to put on a great show because it's very you're exhausting. dependent. So it really is. Very yeah. Exhausting. So especially, especially so when you're think- an so I can appreciate what you do when you're speaking into a microphone all day long. Uh, when you're up there for two hours <laughs> screaming into a mic, and I, I'm competing with now. For example, now let's say you have uh, four or five hundred women in, in in the nightclub, and you've got maybe thirty men running around in the crowd, like just banging them for tips. And you're on stage with a microphone, trying to control the audience and get them to follow the show on stage while there's men on the floor competing for their attention. So there's yeah. this, this madhouse of just uh, just me screaming into a microphone for two hours. And uh, you know, then it's all over and all you want to do is sleep. Yeah. So, sorry, and I forgot to mention that as well, um, which is the, the master of ceremonies thing is a big, big job. It's a big job. Mm. It's a big job. You've got so many things to process as, as you're talking about. You're managing, you know, this wild, rampaging, hormone-fueled female sexual cattle rush. <laughs> and so it, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, to to manage and to control, and you're kind of responsible for the quality of the whole evening. And if you mess up, some of the other dancers might not get as many tips. So you know you're you're out there representing, so to speak, right? So it, it's a big job. So my question is, do you think that you'll be able to focus on developing other opportunities for yourself, Usman, if you continue to work at nights and and doing the master of ceremony stuff? Do you think you'll have the energy and focus to do? To, to build sustainable other things if you're still doing this amount of work at night? Um, honestly, looking back at the last 10 years, I think not. I have to, I have to, if I have to be honest, I think, uh, you know, my week is mostly spent just working out and looking forward to the weekends. And then, like I said, making enough money on the weekends to, again, just push me forward. You, you right. make enough money. And the thing is this, I mean, most guys are wasting their money on women, right? So... I show up for work and I got all the free women I want, right? And and they're giving me money, so I'm 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 making money and I'm not spending it on chicks. So, so. but to, to the, okay, <laughs> just take step me through this if if you can, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, how many women are you sleeping with a year? Uh, every year is a little bit different. Uh, I don't know I, if this if, all right, this year. Um, let's just let's just count this year, right? January, February, March. Uh, this year, I say four. Four. Yeah, that's not oh. bad, right? That's that's pretty good. Well, the thing is, I, I wasn't I wasn't stripping. I, I stopped dancing. I stopped. Dancing. Okay, but Remember. but give me give me give me peak poon season. Well, oh, what are we okay. talking here? All right, so I'll I'll tell you. Like, I'm I'm more conservative than most guys. All right, so uh, for me, uh, honestly, I want to say uh, you're gonna you're gonna meet at least ah, Jesus, I don't know one one or two women a week. If you're gonna if 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 you're looking for it, you're definitely gonna get at least one or two a week. Uh, I know I know guys that that literally make it their mission to bang three or four girls a night and they, and they get it done. So, you know, and we're, so we're looking at uh, guys that get, ah, uh, youth. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, yeah. And these are the guys that are like 20, 21, 22, 23 years old, the 23 to 25 year old guys, they're literally like, I mean, they'll take a girl, you know, into the bathroom and, and get a blow job and then take another girl into the corner and maybe slip a dick inside of her. And like, they're just doing all this crazy shit all night long and getting paid for it. And the girls are not like, they're not a train wreck. These are like young, pretty girls all in their early 20s. I mean, all bachelorette age range. So it's just, uh, man, it's just, it's just, yeah, if you're looking for it and if you're working for it, you'll absolutely get it. I don't, I don't want to exaggerate and make it sound like it's an extreme thing. I mean, there's, there's 
there's there's dry spells for everyone. But I mean, for us, it's just not very long. <laughs> you know, it's a, a dry spell is a weekend where you didn't meet a girl. Well, for you, a dry spell is like the space between a raindrop. It's not exactly uh, Arizona time out there, right? Okay. Um, it's just, uh, I, I'm assuming that none of these women are named June Cleaver. But, um, okay, so I assume, is there is there a big problem with STDs in this community? If there is, no one talks about it. I mean, I'm not going to wood. I've never gotten anything. So, right. but I, I, I honestly, I tell you what, I think it's overrated. And it's probably not a health, not a smart thing or a healthy thing to say for for listeners. But uh, I remember when I first got into the business, I was very conservative with sleeping with women. I didn't really want to do it very much because I was so hyper obsessed with getting an STD. You know, I'm a health fanatic, right? So, and then I, I I know these guys, and they're literally just fucking their asses off, and 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 they're not even wearing condoms, and they're all fine. And and, and it's it. Uh, uh, there was a friend of mine who gave me the example of look, it's the guy that jogs every day that you hear about dying from a heart attack. Now, while that's not statistically true, it's it's anecdotally true. So it's it's one of those things that just you know these guys are just they're just going nuts all over these girls, and nothing's happening to them. And meanwhile, you'll have like a friend who doesn't work in this business who just maybe met a girl at a bar or maybe met a girl in school and he sleeps with her and he gets an STD. So it's just I don't know. I feel like the the overly playing it safe stuff is a little bit overrated. I, I think that given your choice of profession and your habits, I, I almost would be shocked if you didn't have that philosophy. So, um, um, okay, so you may be a couple of girls a week. Now, how does that work? So you, you're dancing and the girl, how, how does she meet you, after right? Party. I mean, so the after party. So we say all the strippers are going to Club X or whatever, K-O-X, mm-hmm. right? They're all going to, to Club X. Right. And then the girls sort of, right, they, they come after. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you're sort of dancing and, and chatting with these girls. And then what happens? Well, it's pretty simple. One thing leads to the next. Then you either leave and go to, go, they'll either have a hotel room or maybe your car outside or, you know, maybe your friend's car outside or maybe the girl's limousine outside. I mean, it's just, or maybe you'll find a bathroom in the club. You, you, you'll make it work. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, you'll make it work. So that, that, that's in the moment, in the night, right? Now, yeah. who's uh, is she, sorry? Is she buying you drinks at this point? At, well, at the after party, we have uh, we usually have bottles at a table, and so we invite the girls to hang out at our table. But the girls are okay. buying drinks, and and they 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 have no gripes with buying us drinks. Many times, have girls grabbed us by the hand, dragged us to the bar, and said, "What are you having?" And we just buy us whatever we want. So they, I, I generally don't. I mean, we never buy them drinks if that's if that's what you mean. <laughs> that never happens. Um, <sighs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm channeling the collective shock and outrage of the vast majority <laughs> of the, um, the male audience of this show. I Yo, just, it, you know, it, it really to. is, it, it really is pretty bad shit. After a while, you just like, you just know what it is. Like now, I've gotten to the point where I don't even have to meet a girl at the club. I can meet her at a gym or a supermarket and go out with her and make her buy me a drink. You just know how to position yourself. You just know you're more valuable, and she will shell out for you. So that 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 that's an interesting dynamic in of itself. And so if you're not meeting girls that night in the in the club, you're maybe exchanging. Maybe you give a girl a, a, a really sweet girl a lap dance, and she's not the kind of girl that wants to sleep with you on the first night. She'll give you her phone number. You'll meet her maybe two nights later. You'll go out for drinks. One thing leads to the next. You're back at her place, and boom. So that that that's the more common way of it going down. It either happens the Do night. You- or- yeah, so it's pretty rapid. Did, did these women ever want to have more of a relationship with you, or was it just basically, you know, scratch the edge? With, with me personally, uh, in my experience, I found that they have, and uh, it's not always the case for all the guys. So the thing is, um, for, for most of the for most of these women, it's just a good time, right? I mean, the good, good looking guy, you know, you, you, you treat them right in the bedroom, and they're pretty much happy, and uh, that's all they ever wanted. But when they find out there's more depth to the person. That's usually when their feelings come out. They're like, oh, my God, I, I found me an alpha male. Not only is he an alpha, but he's smart and he can articulate himself or he has ambitions or he has goals or he wants to do other things and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, they create this maybe cartoonish character in their mind of who you are and maybe the kind of person that, you know, that, that they want to be with. So then it, it happens. Uh, generally, for me, my personal experience has been um, almost every woman I've ever met at the show, they meet me as the performer and uh, when they meet me outside of the show, they almost feel like they can't connect the individual from the show to the individual they're having coffee or, or a drink with later. You know, uh, I, I, I don't carry that stripper persona everywhere I go. 
No, of course not. Of course not. Um, and have you had, uh, have any of these flourished into more long-term relationships? No, I've never been with a girl longer than about six months, and I've never been in love. You've never been in love? Nah. Have you just seen too much? <laughs> I think it can happen. I, I just, uh, maybe I have faith it can happen. I don't know. But uh, I, I, the thing is, I, I tell you, it, it's the craziest thing. It's just you, just, you just really feel bored and frustrated with the girl you're with. And you just can't stop looking. The thing is this, when you're, when you're, especially when you're dancing, if you're dancing every night you go to work, it's, it's difficult as hell to just do your job and go home. So if the woman is with you and you're a male dancer, you gotta, you gotta, she has to really appreciate the fact that you're fighting your instinct for as long as you're there at your work. And, and you're, you're being faithful and loyal to a girl is very difficult. Uh, this is why I don't have long-term relationships. I'm an, I'm an honest guy. I won't cheat on a girl. I just won't stay with her very long. Because sooner or later, like the drunk in the distillery, you're going to give in, right? Pretty much. You, you yeah, I mean, if you've, got, if you've got vagina cannon fired at you all day, sometimes every now and then it's like murder ball. You just you ain't going to be able to dodge, right? It's just, it's just you're surrounded by so many options. I mean, so, so you're dating a brunette and you're like, you're like, now you see blondes. You're like, huh, that's nice. You're dating a blonde now. And now you're like, hmm, a Colombian. You know what? I'll go for that. And then you go for a Colombian. You're like, hmm, check it out. Look, we've got an Arab girl there. You just, you just never stops. And that is the problem. You just, you, you just keep going. <laughs> right. Yeah. Do you uh, do you think that you ever do want to settle down, get married, have kids, that kind of stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Uh, I mean, maybe not marriage in the legal sense because I'm not a fan of. Uh, but committed in some way, right? Yeah. I mean, I want to have a family. I definitely want to have children and uh, and and live with a woman and, and and make it work. And I definitely want to be able to do that. Right. Right. So so that's going to be a whole different kettle of fish, right? That's going to be a whole different. <laughs> things you need to find because right now you're looking for like your dick is leading you to women right mm -hmm. but when you want to settle down it's the, the happiness of your future children is what needs to lead you to the woman right right and and these two things kind of opposite you know like you're going to have to develop a whole other set of skills in terms of evaluating women and judging their characters because right now you're just looking to discharge, right? Oh, but, oh, no. but, I, so you're I, not looking for anything long term, and you're looking for specifically physical physical characteristics. But you need a sort of golden heart of maternal wisdom and good friendedness and and health and happiness and positivity and a willingness to work hard because raising kids is hard work. And so you're going to have a whole different set of standards that you're going to need to develop, right? Oh no, I know I. Standards I've got. It's just the matter is, like, well, when I look, when I meet a girl and I say to myself, "Well, you know what? She's going to be good for a couple of weeks." That's exactly what I'm looking for. But if I, but if I'm out there actually looking for a woman that's a long term investment, it's a whole other set of criteria there. And it, it, to be honest, generally when I meet a woman that fits that criteria, I usually pull back. I don't, I don't go for them. So I'll, you avoid women of uh, sort of spiritual quality, so to speak. <laughs> I don't want to get tied up with a girl that I could probably really get emotionally attached to while still doing this line of work. I don't want to be, I don't want to have this dilemma of, oh, I really love and appreciate this woman and want to have a life with her, but I've got a show to do on Saturday night and I've got to deal with the same shit that I deal with all the time. I'm much better at it now because after 10 years, it doesn't have the same appeal that it did before, but the appeal is still there. As long as I'm a man, I think the appeal will always be there. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it diminishes over time. Uh, you know, as Socrates said in his old age, being free of sexual desire is like having a demon ripped out of your heart and pushed through a blender. You're free. But no, I so okay, okay. Uh, so right uh, now, here's something funny. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just, just, just a funny thing. So with me and the guys, we 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 were asking questions. We do stupid things all the time. So this is a silly a would you or would you not kind of question. And and I, there's a difference between the younger guys and the older guys. I bring it up because of what you just what you just mentioned. So I asked the younger guys, you know, all the guys that are in their early 20s and maybe maybe into their early 30s, uh, you know, would you rather uh, have a micro penis for the rest of your life and have an additional 20 years on your life? Or would you rather maintain your penis size and lose 10 years on your life? Everyone in their early 20s wanted to lose 10 years on their life. They did not want to have a micro penis. Everyone in their 30s could not figure out exactly what to do. It was either or. Everyone 40 and older, they all wanted a micro penis. So everyone don't, don't Japanese guys live longer? But anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> for another time. Um, yeah, no, I, I, so obviously sexual... Um, Sexual hunger diminishes to some degree over time, which is, you know, you know, when you're young, you think it's a disaster, but it's, it's really not. Look, I can concentrate. Um, 
So as far as, you know, being lazy or doing this or that, I mean, if you're still involved in the business, uh, in, in stripping, in the stripping business, do you feel that that might be an impediment to a very high quality, maternally inclined, great woman um, to get married to a guy involved in the stripping business? That sounds like a leading question. I genuinely, I'm not sure. So I'm just curious what you think. Okay, uh, two ways to approach that. One, if you're a dancer, yeah, uh, you, you, the woman will absolutely uh, hesitate, to say the least, to be with a guy uh, long term. Uh, but if you're, again, if you're on the back end, if you're in the business of selling tickets and organizing events and marketing and advertising a show, uh, you know, you're never taking off your shirt in front of an audience, obviously. So uh, I would imagine a woman being all for that. So if you're on the back end running the business, you can get married and there will be no problems. But if you're on the front end performing for the show, you're going to run into a wall. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that. I know, but I could imagine that it's not like there's no problem. I mean, there's a difference between being a lawyer and running a strip club in terms of how a woman might perceive you. No, you're 100% right. But I, I will say this. The uh, owner of the, uh, the company I used to work for, I mean, he's, he's raking in millions a year. And his wife is, I mean, this guy makes maybe six figures on a Saturday night. So uh, I don't think any woman would sneeze at that. I mean, lawyers don't make the money he makes. So, you know, it's, it, it really depends on what kind of success you're experiencing. No, 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 sorry. But, but you're saying that the woman, the quality woman is only interested in the money. Ah, okay. All right. So, well, I mean, hey, look, she's a, she's a good mom to their children. She's, I, I don't know what their business is behind closed doors. But what it looks like from the outside looking in, it looks like a healthy, normal relationship. Okay. That's, that's well, what, again, you've seen yeah. it and I haven't, so I'm obviously going to take your word for it. No reason to, to not. So when it comes to sort of your life goals, mm -hmm. uh, certainly I, I would say that you're kind of in a groundhog day of noise and talking and sex and body oil, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of a groundhog day in that it's kind of tough to progress. You can't really get better at what you're doing after 10 years if what you're doing is mostly physical. You're right. right. And, and you know, so I think that the thing you're at the peak of, of what you can do. And, you know, as you age, it's, you know, going to decline in terms of what you can do. I mean, I, I can sort of keep getting better at what I do because it's sort of open ended and, and intellectual. But what you're doing is sort of crowd management plus physicality. You're kind of at the peak, which is kind of like this. I mean, is there anything that you would like to improve in what it is that you're doing? Uh, well, the reason why I wanted to start my own brand was because I feel like it's run very poorly. So uh, the business, after being in the business for so long. Oh, I, no, sorry. I, I just mean like as, as a dancer oh. and as a master of ceremonies, do you feel like you could do anything? Like, is there anything where you say, wow, I'm really bad at this. I should work to improve it. Uh, everyone can always be a better dancer. You can always be better in the sense of selecting your music and performing the, the song better or coming up with new tricks to wow the crowd. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of like any other performance art. You can kind of go anywhere with it. But I mean, is it going to really bring you more money? I don't know. I, I think uh, well, it's it's incremental, right? It, and, and you know, obviously, if you chose more Enya as your musical backdrop, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, you probably know who that is. But anyway, so so you're kind of there's not anywhere for you to go, really, in terms of substantial improvements after you've been doing this for ten years and you're very successful. So that's why it's kind of like a Groundhog Day. Yeah. Uh, insofar as you know, if if you have a job that's manual labor, and to some degree, your job has manual labor elements to it. Mm -hmm. You can only get so good, right? And and yeah. then you can't, right? Yeah. And so that that aspect of things is one of the reasons why I think that you're kind of getting frustrated is that you're obviously a very intelligent person, ambitious person, and verbally acute person. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to do more, and yet your job is like kind of the same thing over and over. And so th there's two aspects. Number one is figure out what you want to do professionally, and I mean – you, you have some good ideas that way, and it might be worth taking a couple of business courses or mentoring with someone in the business or paying them for their knowledge, time, and wisdom, and so on, because that's the one thing that I wish I'd done in business was to get more mentors, to have more mentors. It's tough, you know, in software business in the 90s was a bit of a wild west. But anyway, uh, I think getting that kind of mentoring is important. But the other thing, of course, is your personal life. And um, the degree to which the life that you've led may have not helped you develop 
the skills that make for a successful marriage partnership or or long term parenting partnership, that may be the case. Because you know you've you've spent your life doing a bunch of stuff, and that stuff is not what contributes to maintaining a healthy relationship in the long term with a woman who is your equal, where it's not just about physicality, right? I mean, everything we do is stuff we're not doing, right? I'm I'm less good at yoga because I spend my time doing this show and people who spend their time on yoga are less good at philosophy because they're doing yoga. Everything we do is everything else we're not doing. And so you've developed particular skills and abilities in this field and you've had the relationship that you've had, you know, where it's a night or a couple of weeks or as you said, 1.6 months, but you haven't developed the kind of skills that will serve you well in maintaining a permanent adult relationship. And I think that's important. I mean, if you want to go to therapy to learn about that or you want to read books to learn about that, that is a skill set that you don't have. Now, you are aware of the business stuff, right? Right. Uh, so you know that you've spent your time in the front rather than the back end of the business. And um, so but you have, know you're going to need to learn stuff. I have go ahead. enough time in the back end. to. Know, here's the thing. I think – uh, aside from the people that are actually in the business right now that are actually doing the things that I think that I can do, I don't I I honestly don't believe there's another person that's more qualified than myself to do this because I've done front end and back end. I've 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 worked on full circle. I I I've organized my own shows. Uh I've I've pretty much done everything that a person can do in this business except step on the gas and push it to its to 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 its you know ultimate limit. And so in other words, I've dabbled in running the actual business but I've never committed to making it my full-time thing. So Well, and you have, sorry, you have particular skills in that the business is run by the customers, and there are few people, I imagine, in the business with more customer experience than you, not only as a dancer, but as a master of ceremonies. You know what works, and yeah. you know what the crowd responds to. That's been your job for years. So you have that front-end experience of what actually drives the business, which is customer satisfaction. So you're uniquely primed to do that. And you can do that, I would assume, with relatively little transition. But when it comes to long-term marriage, you have a skill set deficiency, right? Just because you've pursued short-term relationships for a long time. So you don't have the same skill set for long-term relationships. And that's where I would focus. If I were you, that's where I would focus on, on building up those skill sets so that I didn't try, you know, if I find the woman of my dreams and I'm ready to transition to, uh, to non dancing and so on, then you don't want to then start to learn how to get really good at long-term negotiations with a an equal based on shared values for the purpose of having a family and so on. I don't think you want to learn that then because you're smart enough to know where, when you're going to need to know something in the future. And I would start learning it now if you're interested in doing that transition in the next year or two. Mm. Do you think there's a relationship between uh, my, uh, you said, lacking the skill set in, uh, in, in commitments with, uh, with women and that also being maybe lacking the skill with commitments in uh, other endeavors, maybe like like I said, like maybe an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial project that I may set out for myself and then not follow through, because well, it, you uh, you uh, you have a conveyor belt of goodies heading towards you, right? Yeah, I mean, how good a hunter are you going to be if you wake up to an overfull buffet every day? <laughs> Right. I mean, yeah. you're you're mean and lean in the abs, but as far as ambition goes, it's been blunted by, you know, this endless rain of poontang and money and little effort and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. So for sure. I mean, and that's been very uh, enjoyable. I would assume we all, you know, you kind of have the life that a lot of men would would envy and dream of. And, you know, it's great that you're sharing the upsides and it's great that you're sharing the downsides. But um, a lot of men have to work very hard for one percent of what gets handed to you every day. And so you've had that enjoyment, but again, you know, uh, the, the muscle of, of willpower and commitment and follow through, which most men develop through endless series of brutal rejections, right? <laughs> I mean, well, who's rejected you? The first time you got on stage, you made $500. What was there? There's a woman who came on who was a um, stripper who made like 450 or something, you even made $50 more <laughs> than a woman. For, so the first time you didn't sit there and say, well, I really want to be a stripper. And you, you, you know, like an actor who wants to make it big, you spend, you know, five years knocking on doors and doing auditions before you finally get your break or whatever. I mean, stuff was now you worked hard, as you say, you were an obese kid, so you worked hard and all that. But as an adult, you've had this conveyor belt of goodies come towards you. So it's not too surprising to me that you'd lack a certain musculature when it came to um, pursuing goals in a really hyper-consistent way. That's more than fair. 
I, I, I agree with that. And it's not a criticism. No, no, no. In, in no way, shape, or form is that a criticism. It's just I, sort of my observation. Exactly. You took the words right out of my mouth. It's a very fair observation. And I can admit to that. I, I definitely, uh, whenever I see a task that requires commitment, I see it as daunting and uh, almost not worthy of my time. Uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, no. what was not worthy of your time? Uh, if, if I set out a long-term task for myself. And, and you know what? Not worthy of my time is a long description. I want to say uh, not worth the cost. In other words, uh, the benefit that I might see for a you know a, a assumed project that might take a year, two years, three years, whether it be a relationship with a woman or maybe a business endeavor that I may have uh, 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 you know in my mind, uh, I look at it and I might get started with it, and once I start realizing the costs of of, of committing to something like that, I, I, I withdraw. I, I'm like, you know what, you know why I don't put myself through the required. Uh, I guess you could say the friction required to get to where I want to get to. Once the rubber meets the road, I'm just kind of like, you know what? It's 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 easier to, and I just find myself falling back into the lifestyle. Sure. I mean, you, you don't build a house if you inherit a mansion, right? I mean, yeah. you build a house because you need to play. It's raining, and you know you get bare house, you bare hands, you got to saw down logs, and right. So, I mean, that's natural. How many people these days decide to go and clear out a couple of acres of wilderness? With their bare hands, in order to, you know, and you go and some some developer did it already for you, and so on. So that I can I completely understand that uh, because you have ninety percent pleasure in the here and now, which then goes down to like twenty percent pleasure in the here and now, or maybe even negative, for possibly a hundred percent pleasure in a couple of years. Yeah, uh, it's hard to make a rational case for that, right? No, you're right. Uh, it, it sounds like, and 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 you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like. Uh, a, a first step to, to to getting better would be to just pull myself away from the dancing business, not not for not permanently, but just long enough or away from the spotlight, uh, just just to be able to exercise those muscles more and uh, work towards. In other words, make it part of the goal where I have a long term goal that I'm working on, and as I build and get towards that goal, uh, additional to that goal will be my re entry into the business, sort of as a treat to myself. For getting where I got or where I wanted to get to, that that would be something that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, does that make any sense, or am I just spewing? Yeah, words? no, I, I think that does make sense. Um, how are you with saving? Not very good. Well, actually, I'm 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 good when I want to be, and I'm terrible when I'm not paying attention. Well, that's the discipline thing too, right? Yeah. Ooh, something shiny! I must buy it. Right? <laughs> I mean, so uh, I can resist everything except temptation, as Oscar Wilde said. So, so saving is a is a key part, right? Yeah. Because if you're if you're doing what you're doing. Uh, and burning through the money that you're making, then you're really not left with much. Right. At the, when the smoke clears from your, you know, 10, 15, or whatever it is, your career. So I, the, certainly the discipline to save is really important because whatever you want to do next is the more savings you have, the better. You know, saving is choice. That That's all it fundamentally is. Saving is free will. You know, if you've got no savings, you basically have very few choices in life. Um, you know, it, it, when things start to change. But if you have savings, then you have choices. You know, I mean, just think of if you're, you know, some guy going for a job, if you have no savings and you've got bills due, you basically, you're in no position to negotiate and you have to just kind of take whatever you can get. But if you're sitting on, I don't know, half a million dollars or whatever, then you can be a lot more picky and uh, choosy. I've always so, been to keep myself above water, though. I've never, I've never really dipped too low into debt or anything like that. I've, I've, if, if, no, but you should. You should by by the early thirties. Yeah, you've been working for ten years at a fairly lucrative profession. You should have some savings, uh, and that I would make that as a particular goal straight up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you accumulate. Ten billion dollars, say, of screw you money, you can run for president, and you don't care what people say about you. So, yeah, save saving is the real key thing. And maybe this is just my Protestant upbringing or whatever, but debt has always given me hives, and um, I, I steadfastly guard um, the choices that I have by making sure that I spend as little as humanly possible. You know, like I'm, oh no, there's a light on upstairs. <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy. I mean, a little too far sometimes. I will vouch but, for this. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, Mike. Mike, how much fun is it to listen to me complain about somebody who left a phone charging in overnight? <laughs> I get on stuff for his uh, "gotta turn the light off" thing. <laughs> Quite a bit. <laughs> I'm literally thinking of getting motion sensors and installing them where the light switches are, so you go the, when people leave the room, it turns off on its own. Because that way, I won't worry that someone somewhere like there are people. You, you should drive through neighborhoods. There are people who leave lights on yeah. over their front door 
all night long. I can't even tell you what that does to me. I mean, it's like that the planet is dying so that you can light a step that no one's using for 12 hours. Anyway, um, so yeah, save. Uh, sa saving, because you know, if you go into business, the more money you have saved up, the more you can invest, the more ownership you can get. I mean, everything you save now is going to pay off tenfold over time. I agree. This, this is something that I've known, but I just, it's like the ugly truth. It's like the fat person that, that knows they got to put the donut down. It's like, ah, yeah. oh, shit. Yeah, I got I to gotta save you know. money. Yeah, I you know. know. Right. You're, you're a smart guy. You know that uh, you got to be saving. And, and now, because you've deferred saving for a long time, you got to save extra, right? Yeah. So getting you to talk about saving might be like getting, I don't know, Bernie Sanders to talk about the national debt. I went to his position page today mm -hmm. to prepare for this show. Lots of positions. No mention of the national debt. The only mention oh. of the word debt is we want to eliminate college debt for students. Like, oh, oh. no. Can you guys ever talk about No. Talk you about would lose your debt. mind. Of everybody that I know in his business, especially all the, oh, my God, anyone, anyone under 28 years old, they're like, they're so brainwashed by Bernie. It's really bad. It's you know, my Facebook feed is covered in just Bernie worship. Sure, yeah, it's sure. Insane. I mean, you know, free stuff appeals to young people who are not paying for it. I get that. My, you know, my my daughter likes free candy. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's, I, and I've uh, I've shared your work many times on uh, on Facebook, and I've uh, even quoted uh, from like maybe sometimes like more powerful things that you said and and used it. And uh, and uh, listening to your shows has also given me a a train of like uh, I want to say like a, a way of thinking or a way of logistically looking at things with logic and I'm able to actually have discussions with people even on Facebook and, and, and kind of like corner them with this Bernie Sanders BS and it, it, it's still just, they just, you know, they put their hands up and they're like, they agree, but you know, Bernie's still, you know, Jesus reincarnated. So they're going to have to go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I, I, I get that. I mean, it's, it's, it's natural. And of course they're in government school, so they don't understand that, uh, you know, here's how Bernie's going to pay for things. Really? I was, in a, I, was in, I was an econ major, actually, and I left during my third year because I couldn't stand paying for learning bullshit anymore. I mean, it really, it's, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm serious. I just, because I came from, uh, well, when I first left school, I was doing uh, physical education, and I was like, oh, I don't want to work in public school. They suck. And so I focused on dancing. And then I said, you know what? I need a backup plan. I'll go back to school. I go back for economics. And I'm um, just about to wrap up college. And I'm like, this is bullshit. I can't sit, sit through this. Now, at the time before going back for econ, I really got into, uh, you know, uh, Rothbard and uh, Austrian economics, and I, I loved the subject, and I thought to myself, this is great, I can go to this college, and it's, it's, it's a reputable school here in New York, and, you know, finance is uh, an easy transition, and I go, I go there, and I'm doing economics, and I'm just like, oh my God, this is terrible. I find myself getting into, like, these battles with professors and other students, and I'm like the, I'm like the old guy in class, basically, in, in, my, in my late 20s, and I'm surrounded by a bunch of these kids, and... It was just it was just bad. So I, 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 I gave up on that. And so, you know, I still hear from my parents till this day. They're like, you should have finished college. And I'm thinking, I did myself a favor. You know, you're not going to get it. It's not what it used to be. It really isn't. No, it, it gets exhausting. Um, I mean, that was certainly for me after a number of years in college. I was, I was tired. I was tired of fighting these people and, and paying them yeah. to tell me things that I vehemently disagree with. It's just not not a good not Especially when thing, I could be so. a capitalist every Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> right. You actually do the free market. Exactly. So I just have one last question, which yeah. is the next time I talk in New York, will you open for me? <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. But you keep your clothes on. Just, you know, you, you'll be better at, you uh, know, if you've done that much better Steph, than anyone Steph, else. Steph, you broke my heart. <laughs> All right. So listen, I really appreciate the call. Let us know how it's going. And, um, you know, if there's anything that, that we can do to, to help as you go forward, you know, if you meet the girl of your dreams and you're having trouble with negotiations, uh, I hope you'll call in again. Um, it was a real, real pleasure to chat with you. And I thank you. You know, I always love it when people shatter my stereotypes, you know, and the econ studying Rothbard quoting male stripper uh, <laughs> is, uh, uh, you know, is a male dancer, uh, is, a, uh, is a glorious detonation of all prior stereotypes. And I, I really appreciate that, Usman. It was a great pleasure to chat. I appreciate it, Steph. And thanks for everything you do. I've been listening to your stuff for a very long time. And if I can get my shit together, you'll be the first guy who gets a check. Oh, I appreciate that. That's why I'm saying save. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Emil. And uh, we'll talk again. Take care. Bye. Take care.